and Nick has agreed to, to, to answer questions. He may have to go off at some point in the meeting, we hope not, but he may go off because there will be a vote in the House of Commons, and there may be a vote, but it may not happen till the end. If he does, we will carry on and, and talk about the democracy project itself. Anyhow, thank you for doing this, Nick, and, and for agreeing to take part in it. You said that you'd be happy to talk about what you thought were the top four priorities uh, for the next government post-2015. And you've chosen four priorities, one which is night crime and the amendment that you've been pushing for a long time, the other is employment, the other is skills and training, and the last one is National Health Service. So I suppose if I could ask you first of all, why have you chosen those four priorities above all others, because you could have chosen poverty, inequality, globalization, Europe, which your party is particularly interested in. Why those? Well, um, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and be part of this experiment. Um, I'm a great fan of uh, being as available as possible in uh, democratic terms. I think there's a big democratic deficit between MPs and their public. And as a new MP who's only been elected since 2010, um, I hope this will help that process along. Um, to answer your question, I think the overriding most important thing confronting any government of any colour is actually um, continuing to rebuild the economy. So I suppose that that touches on everything we do. I've, I've however, highlighted four things that have both become important to me um, and I think in many senses, uh, touch the lives of most people, with the exception, of course, of knife crime, which is something I unfortunately have a lot of experience of in North London. And of course, is very topical now here in the UK, as we are debating whether to impose mandatory jail sentences on second time offenders for carrying a knife. And I suppose that's why that's there. And it may interest people to talk about that. But actually, jobs, employment, skills, uh, they are wrapped up in the same issue. And one thing I have learned as someone who started a new business, uh, which was basically an idea started in a pub back in the late 80s, um, was I have been through uh, the joy of uh, employing someone, offering someone a job who has either not been in work or is just starting their business life and seeing what a massive difference this makes to people and understanding also in a recession that sometimes when you lay people off uh, it is one of the most shattering things to do for those individuals because it is a life-changing issue so I'm very interested in moving the economy along to help employment but above all get the skills and training right for the future Let's take the first one first. I mean, your amendment, and you've been pushing this for a long time because of, I know, the knife crimes in your own area, is the, the demand for these sentences after a second conviction. Um, why do you think that's important? Do you actually think it will be a deterrent, or is it just punishment that you are concerned with? Well, it is, it is both, obviously. Um, the fact of the matter is, if we look at the statistics, in the UK, there's been something like 16 thousand uh, uh, knife crime offences, uh, which are effectively for possession of a knife. Now, about one in four of those are serious enough, in some senses, to warrant a jail sentence in the eyes of the judges. However, the reality is our sentencing guidelines, these are the issues that judges are meant to look at, say that if you are caught in possession of a knife or an offensive weapon for the second time, you should actually receive a jail sentence. Now, the thing, the thing that's happening at the moment is that is not happening. So one has to ask, um, are we really sending out a clear, coherent message from the courts that the knife culture, carrying a knife, is acceptable and that actually many offenders now see the punishment and 7,000 got cautions, slaps on the wrists and fines, they see that as simply an occupational hazard. To defeat knife culture, 
it's not just about sentencing. It's about many other issues. But it is very important that the boundary is drawn. There's a red line that says what is and isn't acceptable. The arguments against that that people have put up is that, um, first of all, your proposal is very expensive. It means more people in prison, and we've already got the biggest prison population in Europe. Secondly, mandatory sentences are wrong on principle because judges should have discretion. And thirdly, if a lot of people go into prison, they will mix with other convicts and come out to create more crime. It could end up increasing crime rather than reducing it. How do you react to those criticisms? Well, they're very fair comments, but I think they need uh, examination. Um, first of all, the idea of mandatory sentences is not new in British law. And in fact, we can find evidence in British uh, justice system uh, where it has worked. Now, it is relatively recent, only actually within the last six or seven years. But for example, particularly in London, the uh, mandatory sentence for a, a, a firearm possession was introduced several years ago and has been one of the things that's had a dramatic effect on reducing the number of prosecutions. Uh, I don't know uh, if that's just my screen. No, nope, it's fine, I'm back. Sorry, it, it disappeared for a minute. Um, however, uh, so, so the principle of mandatory sentencing, I don't think is new. And what's politically interesting over here is the people who are trying to block it in the coalition are actually the Liberal Democrats, our coalition partners. And yet they voted for mandatory sentencing three years ago in 2011. So there's a bit of a pol political sort of um, party politics going on in here that's, that's created the, the debate at the moment. But the other point to understand here is it's often argued that the mandatory sentencing um, will just send people to prison and make them hardened cr criminals. What I would say is, if you have knowingly gone out and put a knife in your possession for a second time, having been to court, there's a pretty good chance you're well on that road to being considered a hardened criminal anyway. But we have changed the justice system now, uh, this year, so that those who are serving short sentences, and my, my um, recommendations are for a six-month minimum sentence, what actually happens is we now give them the training and mentoring, not just when they're in prison, but when they come through the gates of prison and when they actually then are looked after and helped into housing, often by someone who's been in, caught up in crime, caught up in gangs uh, themselves. So I think it is... Unfortunately, if you are going to go to prison, you're not just left there at the gates, given 40 quid and told off you go. The idea is to reform and rehabilitate as well. We just had one question come up, which um, is not entirely on this, but um, I'll give it to you anyhow and then come back to this. You said, and I'm sure I know your answer to this, but would you agree to a live debate with other, with other candidates at the time of the election next year? Oh, uh, not only will I agree, I've done them before. And in fact, I was very disappointed that we uh, didn't actually have one at the last election. So I'm always up for open debate. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, not just with other, other candidates, um, I often am quite happy to debate on uh, specific campaign issues with people who may hold an opposing view to me, but may not necessarily be in Parliament. So yeah, I'm up for it. Another point that's come up is that you've talked about mandatory sentences and so on. The question is, what's your view on restorative justice? Isn't that a more effective way where the victim and the victimized meet together? Because there are signs that that reduces crime and also saves money. Well, restorative justice, justice has a key role to play, uh, but it has to be done with the willing consent uh, of the victim and with the willing consent of the perpetrator. So like all things, I urge people, when we talk about the knife culture and the mandatory sentencing issue, it is just one of the devices that needs to be used to actually deal with the scourge of the knife culture that actually can lead with someone who uses a, a, possesses a knife into using a knife, and they're not unfortunately using it to um, seriously injure someone or potentially kill someone. And, uh, and that, at the end of the day, will involve mentoring, education programs, as well as clear boundaries on sentencing. 
um, the we could go on to to employment um, yep. and talk about that. Uh, though we have one, one other question that's just come up from Peter Felton. He said, coincidentally, the BBC Panorama program tonight, just after this webinar, is entitled "From Jail to Jihad." That is on the radicalization of some prison inmates. Have you got any thoughts on that? Um, okay, uh, I, I, I mean, I wish I was seeing the program actually, because I think there's no, no, no doubt that radicalization on our own shores is clearly uh, has happened. I don't think we should pretend it's happening everywhere um, and all the time. Is it happening in jails? Um, I don't know. Is the answer to that? I'm on the Justice Select Committee. We haven't looked at it in great detail. You will find when I don't know something, I will tend to admit it. Uh, but if you like, this homegrown um, uh, terrorism is something that does worry me. And if we look at um, Syria, uh, I don't want to exaggerate it, but there is quite clearly a potential threat that people who have gone out there uh, for whatever reason uh, and have been uh, trained in what is a uh, hostile um, war field. Uh, could potentially come back to our country and cause problems. And we, we shouldn't be frightened of admitting that. We should just be alert to it and try and stop it. Uh, Hosh Shapriel has also uh, just made a remark. It's not a question. He's congratulating you for doing this experiment and engaging. So that's Thank a really you. good piece of positive feedback. And, uh, if we go on to employment, I, I remember reading a New Statesman article once where you said you went into politics because when you started up in business, you thought there would be help around, but there wasn't, and you were determined to change that. You wanted to go in so that there would be help available for those people who wanted to start up in business. So to what extent have you been successful in that, in helping people start up in business, and what more do you think needs to be done? Well, uh, the, the reality is I'd love to do this on air and claim single-handed responsibility for some of the policies that the government have done to make a genuine effort to help people starting business. But I'm just glad to be part of a, a, a party and a government that have put in place some of the ideas that have helped businesses. And I assure you, had some of the things been available when I started back in 1989, um, it would have just made it a little bit easier for me. And the interesting thing is, Francis, I know you're only 21, uh, but, but I'm a little bit older. And the workplace, the workplace is changing quite phenomenally. Um, there are more and more people who are now actually starting as consultants, individuals, freelancers, um, going into self-employment almost from the start, and more and more people moving into it. So some of the help has also been really useful for them. So for example, um, you can now actually get access to a small startup loan uh, of anywhere between two and ten thousand pounds, which uh, can go by going through people like in my constituency, going through uh, North London Credit Union banks and Field Enterprise, and taking advantage of a government scheme where if you submit a decent business plan, you don't just get a bit of money, but you get mentoring and assistance, something that I didn't have. I mean, when I started my business, I was offered so much help. I thought, oh, this is great, but when you nailed it down. It was basically a consultant that someone would pay half the money for to help me set up my business. But given I didn't have much money to set up my business in the first place, the last thing I was going to do was go out and try and find the other half to pay someone. And I felt the gap between rhetoric of supporting small business and startups and the reality was very divorced. Now it's very different, uh, including some of the early employment measures. So, there's no national insurance for people under 21. Apprentices now um, are really well-structured training, training programs and are very suited to small businesses. Most people look for them for larger businesses. Um, so I do think there's, there's quite a wealth of uh, opportunities and talents out there. And if anyone in Enfield happens to be on board as well and they're not sure where to go, come and see me. Okay, uh, John Embury has put in a question as well, and oh, by the way, I'm, I'm not 21, I just look it. Um, but John Embury um, has put a question on is, how is government planning to tackle and minimise the employment rate, especially amongst young people? 
who have qualifications but no experience. Yeah, it's the old cycle, isn't it? Of um, uh, no, no, no experience, no job, no job, no experience. Um, look, first of all, um, I think there's a, a two-way uh, problem here. So if I deviate a little bit, let me know. I, I, went, I went into lots, I've been into lots of schools and I'm a little concerned that we have yet to see a big shift. Uh, it started, but a big enough shift from having people focus, for example, on uh, just getting exams and what management consultants call the soft skills, what I call the employability skills. Um, for example, we are turning out people who may be getting A-levels, but if they actually at that point, and even degrees, and if they get what well, that point want to go into work, what we're actually finding is that they are really going to struggle to actually get a job because they haven't developed the interview skills, the way to present themselves, um, actually get the cut through when applying for the jobs by um, uh, doing decent research, all the sort of stuff that actually will achieve a little bit of difference for an individual rather than just relying on the exams. So I think there's a two-way thing here. There is more employers can do and government can do, such as the massive expansion in apprenticeships. Now, there's still a problem with apprenticeships because I've, I've noticed when I go around and um, meet people, apprenticeships are often still seen as the more traditional routes of engineering or car, uh, car, car maintenance, etc., etc. Whereas, in fact, in reality, more and more apprenticeships have been both designed to suit specific needs of businesses, as well as the professions, the accountants, for example, the consultants, those, uh, the, the agencies, the exhibition design agencies, the graphic design agencies. We, are now, we, are, we now have to raise the professional standing of apprenticeships to encourage those who are not going for an academic career to go down those routes. That's actually in place. It just needs to be rolled out and expanded more. The, the final thing, and I, I think this is, this is key, and I'm seeing it successfully done in my constituency, is employers are quick to complain that they cannot have the skills, they can't get the skilled employees they need. And what I'm pleased to see is that rather than just moan about it, many of them are now working with the colleges in particular and the university technical colleges where people start from the age of 14 to design courses supplementing the essential educations that will turn out the draftsmen, the engineers, or whatever it is they actually need. And there's a great company in my constituency, big exporter, called Kelvin Hughes, for example, that is working with the new UTC that's at the bottom end of my constituency to do just that. Just a final point on employment, though. You said the problem in youth unemployment. It is a problem. It is still too high. Actually, most constituency have seen it drop anywhere between 15 and 35%. It's a good start. It's a long way to go. But I'm also finding a real challenge for the 50-year-olds and over. And my next jobs fair, I'm hoping, will focus on trying to match local needs. Um, I know you can't be age-specific in these things, but I'm going to put quite a lot of effort into trying to fill that gap, because that is a growing problem. Uh, ben Watt, uh, Chavez also mentioned this problem about how you help uh, young people with activities and employment. So we, we sort of dealt with that. Several people are asking, can they ask questions outside of the brief, like questions on uh, uh, Boko Haram, Ukraine, Iran, and the answer to that is yes, Nick is willing to take questions on anything. But we've got to focus. People want to speak on anything, please do. Um, uh, Ali Nawaz has said he talked about, we talked about radicalization, and there was a question on it. He says that um, ethnic minorities are suffering from radicalization as much as local British natives. Any strong, strong measures taken by the government uh, will be welcome. So, do you have any ideas on that? Uh, no, and um, uh, to, 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 to be blunt, I think it's, it's a very welcome message that you know, any citizen in this country that is prone to radicalization, particularly in difficult times. However, however much we think things are getting better, they are still rel relatively challenging times. What I do think is, I'm, I'm not a politician that just looks to government to do everything and solve everything. I think the government and the security services, the police were quite right to say, 
We need to urge communities to have the confidence to come forward where they believe radicalization is taking place. That, the only way we can do this is in partnership with communities of all sorts from all across the country. We need to make it easy for people to do, to go to authorities. We need to make it in confidence and we need to build that trust um, for people to do that. And actually building that trust is quite a challenge um, across any community. But it does require the local communities to be as responsible for this as would be government in dealing with it if and when they come across it. You talked about trust and Joel has uh, put a question on which I suppose relates to trust and he says, do you think MPs should be allowed to be directors on the boards of multinational companies? I mean, of how of which companies? Commercially, right? uh, multinational companies, okay. corporate multinational companies. How can we divorce commercial interests and assist MPs to be really servants of their electorate without those interests? Well, look, I'm, I am old-fashioned like this. Uh, I got into Parliament because of my business experience. It was one of the things that brought me into here because I'm very passionate about small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, and uh, uh, I, I have absolutely no problem with MPs of any uh, political colour or persuasion serving in institutions that they were either involved with beforehand or wish to get involved in. So it could be a charity, a vocational group, um, and it could be a, a corporation or a small business. What is vital is that they are absolutely transparent about what they do. And the vast majority of MPs are very transparent. We have one of the most transparent systems where you have to publish everything. What I do accept, and I think this is behind the question, is hang on, if you're going to go and spend lots of time doing uh, lots of non-executive directorships and not do your job as an MP, you're quite right. I would expect an MP to use their judgment and actually use their judgment when they accept something that it should be ultimately in the benefit of Parliament by broadening their experience. What I also would like to see more of is, um, for example, um, industry and Parliament working together. I would like to see um, groups that we have where, for example, police force, the army, I would like to see extended to teachers and so forth, where MPs go away on a voluntary basis for up to 20 days a year, often at weekends, where they then serve with various organisations. So I've done that with the RAF, I hope to do it with the police shortly, and some colleagues go and do it with um, uh, business areas. So that you don't have to take the non-executive director route. You can do it on, a, on, on a, uh, a, an industry and um, parliament basis. Uh, and I'm all for that because I do not want professional politicians who leave university, who come into politics as researchers and go on to be MPs. If I had my way, and I know this goes against my political philosophy, I wouldn't have an MP under 40 on the basis that they would have done quite a lot in their lives before they get here. But I declare an interest. Because I'm 54, that would probably suit me. Okay, and Barbara Simpson's come on and said this is a really good session. And can you throw some light up on any upcoming plans for helping small businesses who are just recovering from the recession? For example, loans for business expansion at this stage of their development. Um, okay, uh, first of all, there's been some micro stuff, and I'm just going to say this in case you didn't get to, to hear about it. Things like the employment allowance, where um, we currently, as you will know as an employer, uh, that not only does the employee pay national insurance, but the employer pays basically what I call a jobs tax, where they pay up to another 10% of your salary to the government. I personally want to see that brought down more and more and the Chancellor has brought it down so every business gets a £2,000 reduction this year in their national insurance bill. Make sure you've applied for that because you know it, it all helps. Likewise, if you are in a business that has a rateable value of under £50,000, that's the rateable value, you will get a £1,000 discount but you have to make sure your council give it to you and apply for it. 
Now, on terms of uh, access to finance, this um, is something that is still uh, quite, um, quite demanding. Uh, and I don't know your individual business circumstances. The, the, the current way to do it is we have to be bringing more competition into the marketplace. You would have heard that. And you probably would think, oh, that's just a, a low ball for long term. Well, it's not that far away. We've got 35 banks going through the approval system, effectively new high street banks that I believe will be focusing very much on what I call the non-investment banking and there to help the small businesses. Uh, and they, I hope, will be providing the competition and access to finance people need. Secondly, I'm also keen that we start, um, people look locally towards their credit unions. Um, now, these are effectively something I never had anything to do with, but they are much more um, straightforward uh, lending organizations that don't always lend against assets. And if with the right consultancy, they'll also lend against a good business plan. And I think that helps. In terms of export sales, there are export credit guarantees out there and small firm loan business guarantee schemes. But you want the truth, I think they're rubbish. I think that they are too complex. Not the export credit ones, the small firm loan guarantee style system. I don't think they're, they're, they'll cause you more heartache trying to get those, I think, than anything else. But the export credit guarantees and the extra funding that's gone into that, talk to your local UK TI, which is through the Department of Business Innovation and Skills, it'll be on the website. If they don't give you good advice, track me down. Um. You're actually, I think, actually on your party uh, parliamentary group on crowdfunding and alternative finance and a, a non-finance bank, it's called, I think. And so you talked a great deal about that. Just had a question about how many people are on the live stream now, and the answer is I don't know, but we'll let people know later. Um, but um, the, another question that was given to me earlier is, I mean, do you think uh, when it comes to startups and developing businesses, the profit motive should be the only guiding principle, or do you think that social value should also be important, as your colleague in your own party, Chris White, has been promoting for a long time? And therefore, how important is it to support the social enterprise movement? The social enterprise movement is something that I have been supporting, um, uh, very much so, and in fact, I've just written a letter of endorsement to try and help one uh, in my constituency today. I think the two can sit together, I think profit, profit motive has to be there because um, it's what you do with the, the profit that matters. And look, I, I took a very simple view um, when I grew my exhibition design and build business and conference business, was that um, I actually, for example, when I took someone on, um, I was actually immensely proud of taking someone on because I saw that as just um, a great responsibility, but also fantastic achievement you had someone working with you they were taking a regular salary and supporting their family and, and all of that so you know there is a real plus side to business without a declared social enterprise or social agenda to go with it however times have changed um, and now I would argue and this may not be what you want to hear I actually think one of the motivations for um, actually engaging as a company, uh, both profit driven and then engaging in the social enterprise element of it, is that makes good business as well. I think people are looking for that. They want to know uh, what your supplier base is, how, um, you know, are you supporting local businesses? Are you supporting uh, local employment where possible? And what are you putting back into a community? And I think that makes quite a big difference. Um, in fact, you might might be interested to know, uh, and, and I'm, I'm sorry if I'm not answering the question directly, because if I'm going off track, bring me back. But there's um, a very interesting crowdfunding model developing where businesses are acutely conscious they want to put something back in, but they feel their main job is to focus on running their business, particularly in the difficult times. But where they are making profit, they're now actually going into a crowdfunding um, mechanism that allows them to support social enterprises, but all they do is just write the check and, okay, it may not be what everyone wants them to do, but it is by extension supporting social enterprises. So I think that's something that is encouraging that people are thinking more about that 
rather than just the profit figure. But I put my hands up. Sorry, I put my hands up. You know, I, I do believe profit is, is not a dirty word. And, and I think companies should make it. It's what they do with it that I think is worth examining. Uh, we just got a nice controversial point coming up uh, saying uh, the unemployment benefit recipients must have more strict regulations to follow before they become eligible for benefits after three months, for example. Um, what's your view on that? Were, were you ta um, the first word I had, were you talking about people coming from abroad into benefits, to gaining benefits? Was that the question? He hasn't asked that. Uh, it's just a general question. Um, um, well, I think I mean, if you want to ask both ways. I, I, okay. Well, I think in terms of um, uh, the the issue of gaining benefits when you come to this country um, as an automatic right is is a is an issue that's linked very closely to the EU, and I don't approve of the setup at the moment. And basically, in the EU, there's 27 countries. Only four other countries have what we call universal benefit system. So um, you get the job seekers allowance and things like that, but actually what is also universal is housing allowance, housing benefit. And that is only true in something like five European countries in total. So inevitably, if someone, because the rules say anyone within Europe who comes to any single country has to have the same benefits, it's not surprising quite a lot of people come to the countries like us with universal benefits because it's a more attractive system. We are now imposing, uh, as you rightly say, three month time limits, etc., etc. I don't think they are sufficient, but they are the best that we're going to get away with so long as we are members of the European Union. Um, because ultimately it will all unfold in court. But that is an important start. But even that has a drawback, because a British citizen who may have worked here for 10 years, paid taxes for 10 years, paid national insurance for 10 years, and then goes abroad to work, even if they went to work for someone like the British Council, who then came back here and didn't have a job, they would have to wait three months for their benefits as well. And that is the lunacy of an EU that does not let us set our own rules and regulations here at home abroad. Now, I'm going to guess that the questioner was also asking about access to benefits in the UK. Well, you know, this is, this is different. I do believe um, we should look after our own, but I also believe it is a contract. Uh, it is not just a right. And I think what we should be doing is not depriving people of benefits um, unless they have failed to deliver on their part of the bargain. And that means, um, uh, genuinely be looking for work. It means if you're offered uh, three positions um, and you don't take them, then I don't see why we should continue to fully fund benefits. I think there has to be a responsible approach. I think there has to be a two-way approach. Having said that, there are flaws in the existing system, in processing applications, etc., etc., which we've got to get better and we've got to get right. Okay, someone's asked a question about the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, democracy and digital democracy. And I'll, I'll leave that to right at the end because I'd like you to sort of sum up when we get to the end about the experiment we're doing and how that might impact on democracy. Um, but going back to employment, uh, one person uh, earlier said the question in, and that is, what do you think is the role of the state in all this? For example, in providing cheap finance, in regulation, in areas such as zero con uh, contracts and in providing training and support? I, I got all of the list of things, but I didn't quite get what the question was behind it. I'm sorry, it broke uh, up. The question, yeah, the question is, what is the role of the state in all of this, in trying to regulate these things? Well, um, I am not a great regulator. Um, I actually think the, um, the scariest words uh, in the British language were quoted by Ronald Reagan when he said, uh, if someone comes to you and says, I'm from the government and I'm here to help, you should actually be very afraid. And I am a deregulator, not a regulator. Um, however, where there are failings and where there are abuses, government should step in. Um, it shouldn't step in with a big heavy hand uh, because often 
they will use um, a mallet to, to crack an acorn uh, with the corresponding unintended consequences that go, um, go with legislation. Um, now, when it comes to, for example, uh, zero-hour contracts, uh, I would never have used a zero-hour contract. Um, it was not something that I would have even contemplated had I known about it. Uh, I've always viewed the relationship between employer and employee as one of partnership, and I've always thought generally that if you're fair to your employees, they're more likely to stay with you longer, because at the end of the day, I don't want people leaving voluntarily, or I wouldn't have wanted people leaving voluntarily. So in the case of zero-hour contracts, I think we need to cut through the uh, media, and I think we need to cut through um, uh, some, some of the, the uh, sound bites on it and actually investigate what the situation is. That is what's happening. There are, I am told, potentially 1.4 million zero-hour contracts, but I'm also told that two-thirds of those are actually zero-hour contracts that work as much to the um, satisfaction of the employee as the employer. The fact is, I don't know, and that's what an investigation needs to handle. I also think there's an element of personal choice and responsibility when people take these things. Government can guide. I think it's only when there's flagrant abuse, abuse taking place should it legislate and bring in the hand of legislation. There's no evidence to support that yet, but if there were, I'd, I'd probably look carefully at legislation and, if necessary, support it. Um, well, there were a couple of others there. Sorry, I, I'm not. I've just forgotten them. What were well, they? It's okay. I mean, I, you, you, I think you made it clear what you think about regulation, and I just mentioned several examples that were given me. But I just had a question in from Benoit Chavez, and um, uh, it, it, it's about economics in a way, but it's also about human rights. And he says that Britain is a leading country in democracy and we rule the law. What will a future government do to ensure that other countries who we trade with and therefore have some power or influence with also, you give the example of Angola, also upholds the rule of law? Well, it's, um, I think it's one of the um, toughest questions a prime minister or foreign secretary always raise. They go to China and they're told to raise human rights um, and they obviously have at the back of their mind how well is that all going to go down. I don't think we should ever lose sight of our principles. Um, and if we hold those principles, dear, I think you know we should be prepared to argue them. But I don't think we should be belligerent. I think it's very dangerous often, sometimes, for us or others to go lecturing um, about uh, uh, other, other countries, which is not necessarily a constructive way to get what you want. Let me give you an example. Turkey is... Um, uh, quite uh, outrageously in my opinion, uh, and I have a large Turkish population here, but um, Prime Minister Erdogan, he basically locked out social media in the run-up to the elections. And actually, many of us over here thought that was really uh, fundamentally undemocratic. It, it's, uh, it was something that we as Democrats were instinctively against. And I think it was right that we raised that, and we acted though as a constructive friend because we, if, if we would actually want to advance democracy in a country, not set it back and have people bring the shutters down and close down their doors and perhaps not look west, perhaps look east. So there is a real balance to do it. I have to say I'm not, um, uh, I couldn't uh, comfortably sit here and have a long discussion on this because I couldn't draw on many examples. But I would simply work for constructive engagement and get someone to see your point of view as opposed to necessarily threaten or bully your way in. Not okay. that you were suggesting uh, that. <laughs> no. Um, you no. talked a lot about uh, employment, and you said one of your other uh, priorities is skills and training. And to some extent, those interlink. And in your answers to employment, you also dealt to some extent with skills and training. But the fact that you have it down as a, a priority suggests you think that there needs to be considerable improvement in that area, that it, it, it is not fit for purpose totally. Uh, I, think, I think it's fundamental because, uh, you know, if you look at it, we, we, we have um, jobs available in uh, many constituencies up and down the country, and yet we have unemployment, which suggests to me there is a mismatch of skill and need. So my view is, what is, what, is the, what is the gap that's missing? 
and how are we going to fill that both for now and for the future? And I've seen it presented in many ways. Um, I've seen it just in a lack of shortage of a particular skill, which is why um, labor will come in from abroad uh, and, and try and fill that skill gap, sometimes at a very highly skilled level as well. Um, and we can't fill it for ourselves because we haven't trained or developed the right individuals. So the whole change program in education to up the basic skills, the reading, the writing and the maths is fundamental. And if you'd seen the, I don't know if there's any other employers out there, but if you'd seen CVs coming across my desk four years ago, and I suspect employers will tell you the same now, where they can't spell, they, they can't present their case, um, where people are turning up to interviews late and actually wondering why this is a bit of a problem, where someone actually pulls out their mobile phone and thinks it's okay to answer a text in an interview. These are the soft skills as well as the educational skills that we need. What I'm really pleased that the government are doing is they are embracing university technical colleges, but they are embracing apprenticeships, they're embracing vocational training, and not just saying you all have to go to university because you know what, you'll all be better people and you'll all get better jobs. That is not true. And incidentally, the career financial differential between someone on a degree and someone emerging from a vocational training program such as an apprenticeship now, is narrowing. So there's every incentive uh, that we're doing it right, we've just got to get more of it. I mean, you talked a great deal about apprenticeships and um, vocational training, which is important in terms of your list of priorities, obviously, but we've got a long way to go, haven't we, to be up to the level of Germany in developing apprenticeships. They've gone a long way. And also, a number of organizations, for example, like Apprenticeship of England, which has 5,000 members on the LinkedIn site, have argued that in apprenticeship things, and there are a lot of cowboys, and there does need to be more regulation, and you're not a regulator. I mean, how do you respond to the, those two points? We're not anywhere good in some of European countries, and we don't have enough regulation to stop the cowboys here, and we don't have enough regulation to stop the cowboys. Um, you, you did break up a little bit there, but I got the gist of it. Uh, I think, no, we are behind Germany. There's, there's no question of that, but we've only really started. Um, uh, we only, uh, sorry, I've got a message. Do I need to do anything on this? No, 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 I think we're fine. Um, uh, we, we, are, we are playing catch up. It's absolutely right. Uh, I'm, I'm slightly confused by the point about regulation because part of the problem many of the small and medium sized enterprise businesses are saying who are reluctant on the whole, to get into apprenticeships, um, is, that, uh, uh, is that they still find it quite a complex process to go through, uh, and they want simplification. What, I, what, I, what, I, what I'm anticipating is that there may be employment regulation that still acts as a, a bit of a block and a bit of a barrier on employment. Um, uh, I, I agree that we've still got more to do in that score. But the actual process, I've, I've got an apprentice, I, I employed an apprentice in my constituency office. The actual process is working extremely well with someone who goes to college, once, was going to college once a week, their assessor came in, assessed us, assessed them. It didn't take too much of our time to actually effectively think, because some, man, some let, let me start again, some, some small organisations think, oh my God, this is going to take too much of my time to train someone. I might as well do it myself, but well, we're not seeing that. So uh, whilst I think the, the trick is raising the professional status of apprenticeships, making it easier to take people on, and, and it is getting easier, um, I, 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 I'm not so sure that we are, are tying them down in too much regulation, but if there is more regulation out there, yeah, we should be rolling it back. But I haven't seen the report that you're referring to. Um, okay, I mean, it, it's, I'll try and send you that and you can have a look at that. But it, it's basically a group which is on LinkedIn, which has 5,000 apprentices on it who talk about the conditions they're in. But let's go to your final priority, which is national health. I mean, yeah. you've said that you think that in this country we don't have really a national health service, we have a national illness service. Yes. Yes. Um, do you want to explain what you mean by that uh, yeah. so that we understand this? 
Yes, I think um, that the, the NHS, which does this fantastic job, is actually being challenged in many ways, this is going to make me popular, but many ways by some of, uh, some of the lifestyle issues that are engulfing a large ch ch chunk of our population. Now, I work cross-party with a guy called Kevin Barron, who was Labour chair of the last Health Select Committee. And we're at one on this, because what is happening? We have, we spend in this country about 110 billion pounds a year, and we only take in, in tax, about 600 billion. So we spend 110 billion on healthcare, on our, what we will all think of as the NHS. Okay, that's fine. But did you know that we are creeping fast towards 20 billion of that being spent on entirely preventable conditions that are fundamentally driven by lifestyle and inactivity? So, you know, in short, whilst we're all talking about an NHS crisis, we are still, I am afraid, not looking after ourselves well enough but relying when we do have an illness, because we haven't quite looked after ourselves for that section of conditions, I'm not saying everything before that gets repeated, that 20 billion of preventable conditions, we could actually both be financially helping the NHS, but above all improving our quality of life. That's well, the lot fundamental of the, approach. Yeah, a lot of the points you raise are about lifestyle changes. And as a non-regulator, you're suggesting we've got to try and change behaviour. Now, there are a lot of non-regulators who say it's not the role of government to change behaviour. How do you square that circle? Well, it's a very difficult square to circle, but I do actually think that there is a massive role for government to show in leadership. Now, you've got big issues. You've got uh, alcohol, which is the biggest issue. But the last proposal to regulate it, I thought, didn't cut any ice because it talked about minimum pricing alcohol. But what people didn't realize, all that was saying to the supermarkets was charge more for these products. And actually, they would just make more profit. So it struck me as a bit of an absurd way of doing it. That wasn't even going back into government, wasn't going back into the healthcare service. But actually, pricing can change habits a little bit. There's no question of that. But the real answer, surely, when half the adult population are not undertaking the minimum activity a week that we've got, we're not going to legislate for that, we've got to encourage for that. By the way, that minimum activity a week is not going down the gym, it is not actually asking you to jump hurdles or go running, it's actually asking you to take one and a half hours walking level exercising a week and half the adult population is not doing that. So you can kind of see that we could get, with increasing activity, we could actually get a very quick return on some of the things we're doing. But above all, it's about improving your lifestyle, and that's the key. There is also waste in the um, NHS, which most people will now be going, oh, he's going to go on about waste now. But, I mean, let me just put this to you. Um, and this goes to the National Illness Service. I'd love to know if any of your um, people tuning in tonight uh, could have a guess at how many prescriptions we issued in 2012 for paracetamol. Now, bear in mind, paracetamol costs 22p to buy a box of about 50 or whatever it is from uh, a pharmacist. And a prescription, which most of them actually we give away free here, would mean a pharmacist gets paid 90p to dispense a free packet of paracetamol. But probably it's impossible to run a, a poll on this because people won't answer. But the answer is we issued 20 million prescriptions for paracetamol. Now that says to me there's a few things wrong, including why anyone would want a prescription for something that costs 20p. But more importantly, why are we issuing prescriptions, except for the very, very needed. 
I mean, you're on the all-party um, committee on primary care and public health, I know, and you talked about the, the important thing in the 21st century is to keep people out of hospital and, and to have yeah, preventive care. absolutely care. crucial. Um, but there are funding implications in that as well. If you, if you, I mean, you can actually change behavior, you can encourage people to walk, you can encourage people to stop smoking, yeah. but there is an element of community care as well in that. And preventative medicine does need resources, and unfortunately, it doesn't have a great deal. How do you square up then the, the funding implications of that uh, at a time of austerity? Can you do this by decreasing funds, or are you going to have to increase expenditure? No, it's it's chicken and egg as well, which makes it even harder to do. Um, so, so, first of all, some of the techniques. I mean, um, here we are having a uh, TV channel to discuss politics and issues. There is absolutely no reason why we cannot expand consultations literally down the line, the digital consultation. But it doesn't have to be necessarily even with your GP. So for example, if you are in a chronic condition um, uh, that needs a regular clinic trip, it could be uh, an asthmatic condition of something, uh, uh, COPD, something like this, and you go to clinics that are doctors, that's actually something that we've run experiments in the northwest of England where it's been done digitally with a consultation with the, the, the clinic nurse, and it's had a, a marvelous effect of capturing everyone and reducing the number of people who end up going to A&E, which is the most expensive place to go for a condition compared to, say, the GP or the clinic that's non-emergency. So you can get some easy wins, which will help self-fund it. But it's a big, big uh, cultural leap. And that is why you are seeing the CCGs now trying to embrace innovative techniques. Now, before anyone says that won't work for everything, I completely agree. It will not work for anything. But it is interesting that the RCN, the GPs, they're all behind this. But actually, it's still, having been spoken about for 15 years, things like telehealth care uh, and telehealth, it hasn't happened. In fact, I think there's a new telephone app that's just been um, introduced called Babylon, which is yeah. a way in which people can actually contact uh, GPs through a telephone app if they have a particular problem, um, which is now being used quite extensively, though it's piloted, I think, at the moment. So that's how the digital technology is, is happening, which I suppose this brings, brings us back to the digital question. Uh, and someone asked earlier, and I delayed the question, where he said, how important is the Magna Carta 800th anniversary um, to raise awareness of the importance of democracy in our communities? And is this what we're doing today is this one example of things to come, more open government through high tech, through the digital age. Well, I got elected in the background of a parliament that disgraced itself on expenses, um, where parliament was seen as elusive and elite, and frankly, the trust in democracy was an all-time low. It hasn't actually recovered very much. One of my missions was uh, to try and uh, help rebuild that trust in a little way, by being open, transparent, admit when you didn't know something, which I think's happened tonight, but also to try and engage at different levels to make people realize that, you know, cut through the, cut through the, um, the media, that what we've got is still one of the best democracies in the world. But we are in great danger of actually whittling ourselves down to the last vote. And ironically, and I hope I can do this, I was reading this book, Philip, um, Kogan, The Last Vote, and I recommend it, The Threat to Western Democracy, um, which challenges pretty much what you're saying. And I believe new techniques, we shouldn't become hostage to the digital age, but new techniques should be embraced as a means to engage more. But I don't want it ever to replace um, the need to literally be able to touch, and if you really want to, throw an egg, at an MP, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I mean, do you think also, <laughs> I know you can't do that on here, but I mean, do, do you think that um, using experiments like this uh, can help to empower MPs? Because MPs, 
to some extent, you know, if you read lots of the diaries of MPs, are feeling pretty frustrated about their role in, in, in Parliament at the moment, their role in life. Yeah. Uh, they feel disenfranchised themselves, and many of them feel powerless. Um, yeah. you think I, I, think, I think it's a great way. I mean, I use social media a lot and Twitter to try and gauge public opinion and solicit public opinion. I'm a backbencher. I'm not going to be in the government. I voted against the government on some key issues. They were my choices. They weren't in the manifesto, so I felt free to do that. But there are times I also know I need to influence the government to see my point of view. So on knife crime, I'm unashamedly using every technique I can to present my case and urge people to write to the Prime Minister or their local MP, asking them if they support my point of view, to actually support my point of view. But I want to argue it, I want it to be out there, and I'm, I'm very happy to be challenged on it, because I think we are stronger if we can say we have engaged. Uh, and, and the reality is, on a Saturday morning, when I go out knocking on doors, and we tend to do a bit more of it this time of year, but I go out every week uh, knocking on doors, at best I'm going to see maybe 15, 20 people uh, in a two, three hour session, um, along with colleagues who will be doing the same. This way I can reach more people. I'm not saying it replaces it, but it complements it. The experiment we're doing here tonight, I hope it's worked, regardless of what you think of me or my views, because I do believe it's right to be challenged and it's right to engage. It's good for the MP and it's good for the um, electorate. Okay, and on knife crime, by the way, it seems like you've now got Ed Miliband on your side as well, so you've had uh, quite a lot of success. Yes, so um, it seems. And I'll take votes from anywhere. I'm not proud. <laughs> yeah, but that, you, you're on record for saying that now. Anyhow, we've come to the end of this session, and I want to thank you for taking part in this. I mean, this is as much an experiment for us as, as it is for you, and we'll be feeling our way through this and trying to see how we can develop it. We have to be innovative, we have to change the format, because if we have the same format every time, I think people will suffer fatigue from it. And so we have to look at new ways of doing it. We were talking earlier before we started this about how we involve MPs and communities. Yeah. With and I'll happily sell what you're doing. Yeah, and, and, and also to sell what we're doing to other MPs, because I think many of them will be interested in it. So this has been a really, really good um, experiment to start with. So thank you for taking part. And I'm so pleased that the vision bell didn't go. So no, it's about to, by the way. They're all queuing up. I can yeah, see it on the yeah, television. Yeah. But we've made it in the nick of time. Um, Great. So thanks very much for taking part in this. And I think we've all enjoyed it. And it's been a really, really good experiment. Thank well, you. thank you. And thank you to everyone um, for taking part. Hope to see you again. We'll talk to you again at some point. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks.